Futuristic cars that don't just turn, they carve. Clean and green machines running on hydrogen instead of gas. Safety systems that won't let you crash and burn. And cars that push the envelope of engineering. Car tech of the future, next on Modern Marvel. What will you be driving? How about 20 years or 50 years into the future? 50 years in the future could be Star Trek transportation pods. That's what it becomes. Science fiction has steadily predicted actual technological progress. You can push the envelope as fast as you want, but you got to be careful that you're not running by your public. Gaze into the future of automotive technology. And you'll find as many predictions as there are dreams and dreamers. One of the breakthrough technologies that will fuel the future is hydrogen. The things that we can do electronically are just absolutely mind-boggling. Cars won't just listen to our commands. They'll talk back. I'll be in the glove compartment if you need me. We see in the future the use of multiplexed electrical systems where we can coordinate a lot of different functions of the vehicle all at the same time. Cars will do more than react. They'll predict your every move. Know what you're going to do before you know it yourself. The automobile is going to be in touch with you very intimately. It won't be a passive automobile, it'll be very active, letting you know things at the right time, when you really need to know them. Aerodynamic design and ultralight materials will push the performance of future cars off the charts. The way it gets adapted from the racing will eventually make its way into everyday passenger cars. Hurtling into the future, we'll find technological wonders unimaginable today. But it took a rocky road to get there with surprising twists and turns that made for an incredible journey. For centuries, men like Leonardo da Vinci dreamed of inventing a horseless, self-propelled carriage. But it wasn't until 1769 that the dream became a reality when French army engineer Nicolas Cugnot mounted a primitive steam engine on a three-wheeled wagon. Historians regard the 1769 Cugnot as the world's first automobile. It was steam-powered with a tremendously large boiler sitting in front of the singular front wheel. Cugnot's car never panned out. From then on, inventors continued to experiment with steam-powered cars, while others were developing electric-driven vehicles. Both had their merits, as well as their limitations. By 1886, German mechanics Karl Benz and Gottlieb Daimler had developed two different cars, both powered by a brand new type of engine. Both built cars of their own, independent of each other. Each car was considered, in its own way, the first practical vehicle. Their propulsion system was the gasoline-powered internal combustion engine. The internal combustion engine is actually much more efficient, takes less space on the, uh, in the same car, and puts out more power than steam engines. These early one-cylinder engines worked very much the same as today's. A potent mist of vaporized fuel and air is compressed inside a cylinder. Then the spark plug fires, igniting a controlled explosion, which drives the piston downward. The pistons turn a shaft, which transfers that power to the wheels. At the bottom of the power stroke, an exhaust valve opens, and the vaporized fuel is expelled out from the cylinder. The system that worked the best at that time was an internal combustion engine using gasoline as a fuel. But the future of the automobile at this time was still in doubt. At the turn of the century, there were only 8,000 motor vehicles in the United States, meaning fewer than 1% of all Americans owned a car. You'd said to somebody, what about horseless carriages? What about, what about those as a future? They just said, what about it? There's no future in those things. Those are toys. But many saw the potential of the automobile as far more than just a novelty. In just a few short years, there were more than 200 companies making cars in the U.S. alone, primarily expensive specialty models. One of those companies was run by a young entrepreneur named Henry Ford. In 1908, Ford had an idea. His brainstorm? Simple was good. Cheap and simple was even better. The result? The Model T. Ford's Model T was the first practical, affordable car. Its four cylinders delivered a mere 20 horsepower, but its impact on the world was immeasurable. Up till that time, most automobiles were really 
playthings of the of the rich. And Ford's goal was to make the automobile not a plaything of anybody, but something that could be a universal transportation device for literally everybody. And they were actually very technologically advanced little machines. They really were. They were elegant in the true sense of the word of being simple, sturdy, and almost completely dependable at that stage in automotive technology. It had an engine with a, a one-piece cylinder block, which was unusual for the time. He made extensive use of a steel alloy that made the steel both light as well as strong. So those things made the car rugged, and it also contributed to his ability to manufacture it at a lower price. In the first year, Ford sold 10,000 Model Ts. When he introduced the moving assembly line in 1914, production leapt to 500,000 a year. By 1924, Ford was cranking out nearly 2 million cars annually. Half the automobiles on the planet were Ford's Tin Lizzie's. Henry Ford wasn't surprised. The way he saw it, the Model T was all the car anybody would ever want. But Henry Ford had underestimated the American public. Popular demand for technological advances put Model T sales in rapid decline. To feed America's automotive hunger, Ford introduced the Model A in 1927. It had a three-speed transmission, hydraulic shock absorbers, and four-wheel brakes. But the public, as always, would soon demand more. After those plugs are cleaned and checked and your carburetor adjusted, you'll get more power and better mileage. Practically from the very beginning, drivers wanted more power from their small internal combustion engines. Most early cars had engines with four cylinders arranged in a row. Engineers felt that adding more cylinders to an inline engine was impractical because the motor would become too long to fit into an ordinary car. To solve the puzzle, engineers came up with an ingenious solution. Arrange the cylinders in a V pattern opposite each other. Bottom line, maximum horsepower with minimum engine length. Cadillac designed and manufactured the first mass-produced U.S. production V8 in 1914. But it was heavy and expensive to make. It wasn't until 1932, when Ford assembly lines rolled out a low-priced V8, that the engine became standard on many cars. In the 1930s, the world was suffering a crippling economic depression. But the car manufacturers vied to beat each other in the horsepower race to appeal to the remaining buyers who still had deep pockets. You had a few very wealthy people who weren't, simply weren't affected by the depression. They were still free to spend. And then you had the manufacturers coming out with V12 and V16 automobiles, cars with double overhead camshafts and four valves per cylinder during the late 20s and early 30s. You haven't begun to see what this car will do. All right, let's go. With the onset of World War II, car manufacturers turned their efforts to making war equipment. Technical advances in power plants, fuels, tire compounds, and plastics were all accelerated. After the war, the auto industry began building cars that, in both style and technology, left the tough times behind and embraced the optimism of the future. New features included automatic transmissions and power steering. Power steering is really simply a device to make the effort of turning the steering wheel, especially at low speeds, easier because it used to be with mechanical linkage, especially when you're in a parking lot, some drivers just plain weren't strong enough to turn the steering wheel. So the power steering system is just an assist to use fluid pressure to aid in turning the steering wheel. While power and comfort may have been most drivers' primary requirement, many were looking for the more exhilarating experience of a sports car. An era of change was about to take place in the U.S., and it began with America's first real sports car, the Corvette, which debuted in 1953. The Corvette is an American icon. Very early on, it became established as a symbol of youthful freedom, a little bit of rebelliousness, but in an acceptable way. The car was relatively affordable. It was fun. Although the Corvette was drop-dead sexy, it delivered more sizzle than steak. They had an anemic little six-cylinder engine, and although it had multiple carburation, it still wasn't as fast as a lot of European competitors. In 1955, the power plant was beefed up to a 265 cubic inch V8, and positraction and fuel injection were added in 1957. 
Chevrolet used it as a test bed for technology, and this is really what the public looks to it to represent. It really was a dream car, but it was a dream that people could go out and buy. It didn't disappear once they woke up. While the sexy two-seater might have been a dream car, many Americans were looking for a sports car the whole family could enjoy. Introducing the unexpected, the new Ford Mustang. Mustang, a brilliant new kind of car. We had the two-passenger Thunderbird, and they said, how do you make a successful sports car? You put two more seats in it. The flashy new Mustang trampled the competition. In 1964, almost half a million people bought one, more than any other automobile in its first year of production in history. The old adage, you know, if you build a better mousetrap, they'll find it quick, and they found it. It had everything, bucket seats, it, it was just a nice car. Well, we had the Falcon, so we had all the pieces. We had the engines, transmissions, and axles. All I did was reskin it, which was expensive, but just put a new wrapper on the baby. That's what it was. It was a Falcon that grew up into a sports car. The baby boomers who drove these sporty new cars might have worn love beads, but in their hearts, they hungered for raw power. Enter the muscle car. Now, this was a decade of rebellion, and so the muscle car was the idea of taking the largest possible engine and stuffing it into the smallest possible car. And it's something that mothers hated and children loved, and, and it was just one of those things that had rebellion written all over it. The muscle cars of the late 60s and early 70s revolved around an off-the-showroom big block engine, some cranking out as much as 450 horsepower. Those engines work really good when they're trying to make lots of power. They had awful fuel economy, but at that time you could advertise drag racing quarter mile times, that's what people would buy. car that was successful like the Mustang, suddenly you want to put a big engine in, they put a 429 in, they had to go wider and heavier and all of a sudden the whole character changed in a 69 Mustang. Different animal completely. But the gas guzzlers were about to go thirsty. In 1973, Middle Eastern oil producing countries turned off the spigot. Suddenly. Gasoline prices in Europe and America quadrupled. We ran out of gas, cost of fuel went up sky high. The traditional companies were still building big V8s that got 8, 9, 10 miles per gallon. There's a car that makes a man proud. It's the Toyota Corona. Japan and Europe were already making cars that were fuel efficient, had decent performance and were affordable. American drivers' priorities slowly began to change. One thing though. You may not be too popular at your favorite gas station. We brought those solutions to cars that were sold in America, and the customers were ready for them. They embraced this new technology. They've embraced lightweight cars. They've embraced better gas mileage. They've embraced lower emissions. They've embraced all of the concepts that we have perfected over the years in our home markets. Today, there are over 100 million cars on America's highways. To make the next giant leaps into automotive technology calls for radical solutions. And the only way to win is to break all the rules. That's what today's engineers are setting out to do with a vengeance. Today there's about 300% the miles driven that there was in the 1960s. So if cars used as much fuel and polluted at the levels that they did then, we, we really would have to have a completely alternative way of getting around because we just couldn't live here. It would poison the atmosphere and we wouldn't be able to live. We've got to be responsible today in the automobile industry to make sure that we're part of the solution, not the pollution. We've got to make sure that we're making our vehicles compatible with the needs of the Earth tomorrow. This requires rethinking how we build our vehicles, how we design them, and how we power them. In 1900, 40% of all automobiles in the United States were powered by steam. 38% were electric, and just 22% were powered by the gasoline internal combustion engine. Modern Marvel's CarTech of the future will return on the History Channel. We spend a lot of time in our automobiles, so it is no wonder we want as many options as we can get to make our lives on the road easier, especially when we're stuck in traffic. Manufacturers have rightly recognized that people would like to be comfortable, they'd like to have their conveniences, the power options. You know, we have hands-free cell phone connections now and DVD entertainment. 
preferably for passengers only, not the driver. And those hot-looking extras, options, upgrades, and gadgets have been selling cars since the beginning of automotive history. Today's drivers take many of these accessories for granted. But for early drivers, they were the latest in future technology. The first cars didn't even have steering wheels. They were operated like boats with tillers. Years passed before someone realized that using a steering wheel with a gear mechanism gave a car far more turning radius. It was simply one of those solutions that somebody tried, someone else improved upon. Ultimately, because it worked, everyone has followed and that now we are completely familiar with. As more and more women got behind the wheel, they demanded refinements that made the experience less rough and tumble and more appealing. People soon wanted cars that had solid roofs and were closed. They wanted things like roll-up windows. They wanted cars with heaters. They wanted cars that came in different colors. They wanted cars with doors. What human beings always want, it turns out, is more. Both men and women demanded a simpler way of starting the engine. Early gas-powered cars required the driver to prime the cylinders with gasoline, especially on cold mornings. Then the ignition switch could be turned on before using the crank to hopefully coax the engine to life. The effort required to do that was very high, so you had to be very strong just to physically start your, your car. And oftentimes when you tried to start the car, it was cold, it would backfire, which would force the crank backwards. And there were lots of broken arms in those days when trying to start a car. The crank handle was connected to the crankshaft, which when turned, pulled the pistons downward. This caused the air and gas to be drawn into the cylinder. An electric trigger would then cause the spark, which ignited the mixture, and turned the engine over. In 1911, inventor Charles Kettering produced a small electric starter motor with enough torque to do the same job. Kettering was working for Cadillac, where his electric starter first became a standard feature before soon revolutionizing the entire industry. All a driver needed was the strength to put the ignition pedal to the middle. Suddenly the car becomes usable, um, practical, attractive to a much larger segment of the population. A lot of developments like that, step by step, made the car more appealing, more practical, more usable for more people. About the same time silent movies got sound, cars did too. In 1930, the Galvin brothers introduced the first commercially successful car radio, which they called the Motorola probably why cars are so popular because you could control the interior of your car so if you had a radio to entertain you you could turn it on and listen to the news listen to your favorite singer listen to your favorite game and uh, get a little bit of enjoyment while you were driving along ignition we've come a long way since the introduction of the motorola today your car can receive satellite carried programming and information from anywhere in the world even in the remotest locations GPS, or Global Positioning Satellite, are already a key element of onboard navigational displays. New networks called telematics are expanding drivers' interconnection with an array of services. Real-time information, based on our exact location, will tell us when we are approaching weather conditions that might affect our visibility or control, such as fog or wet roads. We will also expect to receive traffic information that will alert us to trouble ahead. If there's an accident or a bottleneck on one of the roads, the system will know where that is, and you'll literally be able to program your navigation system to route you from point A to point B in the fastest time, considering the traffic conditions that exist right now. These same systems can also signal a remote network of a car's location when stolen or in trouble, even put us in touch with a live operator. In the cars of the future, Electronics will continue to expand their role in all aspects of control in monitoring systems. Your car of the future might include conversational speech technology that allows you to speak naturally to control onboard systems. For example, watch what I can do with the instrument cluster. Show me digital gauges. Preferences. I'm cold. Turning up the temperature two degrees. Turn off the car voice. Preferences. Oh, okay. I'll, uh, I'll be in the glove compartment if you need me. 
and you'll even be able to decide where you want different switches in your car. I know my wife uses the phone more than I do, so that will probably be the thing that gets closer to her. So inside here, I can imagine the phone would be there. For me, it'd probably be navigation because I'm top of with the challenge and I'm lost all the time, right? So you, you can imagine that the switches would be presented differently. Today's cars contain as many as 30 microprocessors, optimizing virtually every key system in order to maximize performance and control. There's a lot of computing capability. Almost everything on a car is either controlled by a computer or monitored. The things that we can do electronically are just, just absolutely mind-boggling. They're, they're absolutely transparent to the majority of customers, which is the way we like it. For example, with electronic controls, when the accelerator is depressed, the fuel is delivered at an even and optimum rate for smoother acceleration and performance with minimum fuel waste. The engine and the ignition system and the fuel injection and then all the emissions controls are, are monitored by what we call an onboard diagnostic system, which is making sure everything on the car is working right. And if it isn't, it can actually make minor adjustments as a correction. This experimental GM car demonstrates the next generation of electronic controls called drive-by-wire. Drive-by-wire technology means the physical linkages between the driver and the device he or she wants to control are replaced by a computer. Instead of steering through a steering wheel and a steering shaft directly attached to the wheels, it's done like every aircraft and these days done by wire. And the same with the brakes and every other interface between the driver and the vehicle. The control wiring is carried in a single harness and permits the driver to locate controls and instruments virtually anywhere in the wide open interior. No mechanical linkages, so it's very easy for us to slide the controls from the left side to the right side. So you'd be set up to drive in England or here, or maybe if somebody gets tired driving, you could just swap the controls over without having to get out of the car. No matter how smart cars get, they still won't guarantee you a free parking space. In Japan, Toyota is developing cars that actually park themselves. Through a rear-mounted camera, the driver chooses the coveted spot in the display. Then, the computer controls the steering and guides the car in. Self-parking cars may be the first step toward self-driving cars, at least in a controlled situation, like a freeway. The system will then check to see if his car's safe, and then it'll walk into a platoon of 10 or 15 cars that will be able to go very close together, maybe only 10 feet apart, travel at fairly high rates of speed, uh, some suppositions are as high as 90 miles an hour, and the driver can stop driving. You can sit back and read your newspaper until you get to near your destination where the control of the car is turned back over to you and you pull out and drive to where you're going. Self-driving cars may be a good idea, considering the distractions from sophisticated entertainment options available now will probably only increase in the future. At Ford's full motion-based driving simulator called Vertex, or virtual test track experiment. Drivers are being analyzed to see just what kind of tasks they can safely do behind the wheel. Maintain the constant distance. Watch for those events in the front and watch for those events in the rear. So basically you've got five things to do that you're trying to pay attention to while we then ask you to do other things. What we're interested in looking at is the effects of some of the newer things that are being put into vehicles, the use of things like cell phone, navigation systems, information display systems that are going into vehicles. What's the effect on the distraction that they provide to drivers who are supposed to be paying attention to driving? The research found that hands-free cell phones were less distracting, but incoming calls were still a problem. In the future, the car may decide whether you should take the phone call. The vehicle is actually sensing what's going on around it, perhaps with cameras and things, and saying, okay, this is now a serious time. I mean, uh, you, the driver should be paying attention. The vehicle makes a decision and, and won't let the phone work at that particular time. These are the types of things that might happen in the future. Drive-by-wire eliminates many mechanical elements and decreases the number of moving parts. It makes the vehicle way less, increases response, and reduces the need for vehicle servicing. Modern Marvel's car tech of the future will return on the History Channel. 
Since the beginning of the 20th century, twice as many Americans have been killed in auto accidents than in all of the wars America has ever fought. Automobile accidents uh, begin to happen pretty much as soon as there are automobiles. Anytime you've got people moving around in some kind of vehicle, eventually something unexpected and, and unfortunate is going to happen. The earliest cars might have looked harmless, but in reality, they were death traps. Early automobiles, by our modern standards, were extraordinarily unsafe. They were very high off the ground, which made them prone to roll over. Uh, typically, they only had brakes on the rear wheels. Uh, the brakes were awful. It used to be that uh, car companies didn't want to talk about safety. They thought, well, that doesn't sell. Let's not remind consumers that they can get hurt in these things. Early improvements were simple ones. Lowering the car's center of gravity increased stability. Widening the wheelbase improved cornering and overall handling. At one time, accident victims were cut to shreds by shattered windshields. After researching the situation, engineers came up with a life-saving solution, safety glass. It's simply two sheets of glass adhered to a thin plastic layer in between them. And this has the purpose of, of holding the glass together instead of breaking into shards. The Swedish car company Volvo was a safety pioneer. In 1949, they installed some of the first safety belts in cars. By 1959, they advanced to three-point lap and shoulder belts, proving that buckling up for safety could make it possible for a crash victim to walk away. But to drivers in America, safety was still a dirty word. They used to always say to me in the press, you said, safety doesn't sell. I said, well, I didn't say it that way. I said, I can't sell it. <laughs> the people won't buy it. I was advertising, if you get in an accident, here's what we've done. We've padded the dash, we put in seat belts, nobody knew what the hell they were. Most people got them and sat on them and said, take them out. What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to hook yourself in. They wouldn't do it. Seat belts were made mandatory features on all cars sold in America in 1967. Now they're more than an option. Their use is required by law. Today, the latest in seat belt design is the four-point system. Three-point belt is very good. But in certain circumstances, you can rotate out of the belt because you're not being held in on one shoulder. With a four-point, it's much like a racing car. You're held into the seat better. And it's not just for the driver. There is a rear seat reefing for the kids, too. What you'll see in the future are seats that are adjustable that bring the seat up and position the child so he can look out so he's comfortable in using the seat belt. Kids are killed only because they don't wear seat belts. The reason they don't wear seatbelts is they're not comfortable and they can't see out of the car. So you'll see that kind of issue being addressed. The future of seatbelt systems will include pretensioners tied to sensors that react to very hard braking or even vehicle collision detection. Warning. Pretensioners for the seatbelts that sense the very onset of an impact and tighten the seatbelts around you and then even as your body is forced forward relax their tension just a little bit so that the body isn't slammed into the seat belt. But there was an even bigger safety breakthrough hidden behind the wheels. One might think that in the last 50 years the prime development to improve safety of automobiles was seat belts, but that's actually a close second. The, the prime uh, safety development has been four-wheel disc brakes with anti-lock. A disc brake includes a rotor and a caliper. The caliper closes against the rotor with applied force from one to four pistons, causing the wheel to stop spinning. The anti-lock braking system, or ABS, interprets the speed and force applied to the brakes and determines the severity of the situation. The computer then applies extra brake force if the driver's force is insufficient. Anti-lock braking systems prevent the wheels from locking up in a emergency stop situation freeing you up, you just hit the brakes as hard as you can and then you can still steer the car and have control of it rather than going into a skid. No safety device has received more praise or criticism from both consumers and car makers than the airbag. Research on the airbag began in the early 1970s. They didn't know what an airbag was. They were said, a balloon blows up in your face, are you nuts? In the early days, there were a lot of concerns, with some justification, about how effective the bag would be. That is, would it go off when you needed it to? And is there a possibility it might go off in error? Since their inception, 
the technology behind the airbag has been greatly refined. They are truly an amazing piece of engineering. When sensors ascertain a collision force equal to running into a brick wall at 10 to 15 miles an hour, nitrogen gas is produced and fills the nylon airbag at a speed of up to 200 miles an hour and within 1 50th of a second of sensing the crash. When they worked and the engineer said it's go time, we made them standard. We didn't fool around, we just implemented them. In the next 50 years, I would imagine that all cars will have whether it'll be airbags or some other, some type of interior safety system to, to protect the occupant from impacts in any direction, whether from the rear, front, or side, or even rollovers. Safety has gone from being almost a taboo subject to being not only mainstream, but actually attractive to a lot of manufacturers and a lot of cars. This sporty little red car is a rolling safety laboratory. Volvo calls it the SCC, or Safety Concept Car. It's packed with technology you'll be seeing in your car in the future. The technology will be transparent. It'll just enhance the driving experience. The forward collision warning radar tells your cruise control when you're getting too close too quickly. Maybe you're getting drowsy and you're all of a sudden approaching a vehicle very close. We will have a system that will alert you audibly and visually. But as you proceed towards this vehicle, we may start applying the brakes. If the sensors no longer detect the vehicle in front, your car would accelerate back to its selected speed. The lane changing aid senses when someone is approaching in your blind spot in the next lane and lets you know before you make a mistake. And there are cameras all over the car to better see your side angles directly behind you and what your kids are up to. What we want to create is a car that there's no surprises when you move around a situation. The SCC is designed specifically to help you see out of the car better. The unique feature is that when you sit in the car, there's an eye sensor that looks for the whites of your eyes and brings the seat up to a position that we know is the best for you to be able to see out of the car. Everything will adjust to your perfect driving position. The seat, the floor pedals, the steering wheel, and even the gear shift. Once in position, blind spots will disappear. What is known as the A pillar is partially transparent so you can see through it. The usual over-the-shoulder blind spot caused by the B pillar is also reduced by 25% because the pillars bend inward. Such a design also adds protection in a rollover accident. The advanced light system uses sensors to automatically adjust headlights to changes in the road. And the active night vision system will help you see in the dark and prepare the car to react before you do. The next stage of the active night vision system where I could see with clarity what's happening on the roadway, now can I analyze what's happening on the roadway and then warn the driver similarly and then control some of the safety features we have inside the vehicle. The experimental F400 carving is Mercedes rolling laboratory. The name carving says it all. It's like a slalom skier carving turns down a tight course. Its main safety feature is its steering system, called active camber control. When cornering, the car's outer wheels lean into the bend at an angle up to 20 degrees, increasing stability and reducing the danger of spinning. The tilt angle is controlled by a drive-by-wire system, which measures speed, acceleration, steering turning, and lateral forces. Then, its active hydro-pneumatic system optimizes the suspension and shock absorption in line with a changing situation on the road, all at lightning speed. It also uses special tires that are asymmetrical, which means the inner area of the tread is slightly rounded off. When driving straight ahead, the outer tread meets the road. When turning, the inner tread is in contact. Mercedes says the system improves lateral force by as much as 30% to 1.3 Gs. It all adds up to handling cornering at higher speeds, more like a motorcycle than a car. One thing is clear. The high-tech car of the future will do everything it can to make our lives safer. But will we be giving it too much responsibility? The driver is really the most important safety feature. We can do a lot. We can add more and more technology, but it's the driver. I think there was a natural backlash to giving over too much control to technology. We like technology to offer us conveniences and safety measures, but I don't think very many people yet are ready to sort of turn over control of the vehicle to a microprocessor and just become a passenger. We like to drive. If we didn't, we could take a bus, take a train, take a plane.
The National Highway Safety Administration estimates that in the U.S., the seatbelt saves over 4,000 lives and prevents over 100,000 injuries each year. Modern Marvel's Car Tech of the Future will return on the History Channel. There are cars, and then there are sports cars. Close to the ground, wind in your face. The world seems to have a love affair with the sports car. Sports cars are meant to be driven, as opposed to passenger cars, which are meant to be ridden in. These are cars that, theoretically, their entire purpose is to entertain the driver and one very lucky passenger. There's a lust factor, frankly, that you want to connect with, a certain freedom, a youthfulness, a time of life, an attitude toward life. Brands like Mustang, Corvette, Thunderbird come to symbolize something in all of our psyches, and that really doesn't go away. But it's not just about fun. Sports cars play an important role in the future of car technology. Since 1904, when Mercedes turned its first race car into a road car, cutting-edge innovations have been trickling down from the racetrack, going first into sports cars, and finally into regular passenger vehicles. The role of motorsport has been an immense provocator of technology improvement. Their engineers are in that gymnasium that's called motorsports. They're being exercised right up to the last tenth or millisecond to gain speed in handling, in power, in transmission, in electronics, in traction control, in braking efficiency, in everything that's related to the motor vehicle. Probably the biggest inroads of racing technology into traditional passenger vehicles is in the tires. Passenger car tires used to be really bad. You know, how often do you get blowouts and, and flats all the time? Uh, you, you go around a corner relatively slow and you hear the tires squeal. Today's passenger car tires are actually as good as race car tires were 20 years ago. Race cars exert tremendous gravitational forces and heat at high speeds. So tire makers have developed synthetic compounds that have excellent performance characteristics in a variety of racing situations. Furthermore, tread designs have been customized for dry or wet track conditions. Racing teams must choose the right tire for a particular track and weather conditions on a given race day. Like so many factors in racing, it's a science. Race cars have advanced aerodynamics and a lot of the lessons learned from developing those aerodynamics have been passed on to traditional passenger cars of today. Other things that come from racing are these onboard diagnostic computers that are continuously monitoring the functions of our cars. That kind of started out as the crew chief sitting on the side of the track with telemetry monitoring what's going on in the engine of that race car to keep track of that. While many production car manufacturers have participated in racing with varying degrees of success, fewer names are synonymous with both race and street cars. Perhaps none personify this idea more than the name Ferrari. Company founder Enzo Ferrari was relentless in his quest for perfection. He was single-minded. He was almost autocratical when it came to ruling his domain his Ferrari empire. Like many manufacturers before him, Enzo Ferrari took advances learned from his race cars and incorporated them into his sports cars. His methods followed a new axiom, race on Sunday, sell on Monday. He was a nut for racing, wanted to use racing to promote his cars, built cars principally for racing first, and then sold them to the public mostly as a way to fund his racing activities. It created a terribly attractive set of reasons for wanting a Ferrari. People who buy Ferraris now, in a very real sense, are buying in to Ferrari's Formula One racing activities because the two really do go together. Ferrari's latest bid for supercar supremacy is the Formula One-inspired Ferrari Enzo. 
a 660 horsepower V12 rocket that bursts from 0 to 60 in 3.1 seconds and has a top speed of over 200 miles per hour. Just as aerodynamics dominate their Formula One car designs, the Enzo's form follows the same function, to pierce through the atmosphere with the least resistance. Ferrari engineers had designed the car to be aerodynamically stable. They've used extensive wind tunnel tests to maximize airflow in order to optimize downdraft and drag forces. They've also borrowed electronic shifting controls from their Formula One cars that are mounted on the steering wheel so the driver's hands are kept where they're needed most. And the steering wheel even displays the tachometer's readings in a series of LEDs. The Enzo is as close to the Ferrari Formula One driving experience as an owner can get. The price tag, a cool $660,000. And then there is the Porsche. Dr. Ferdinand Porsche is credited with creating the Volkswagen Beetle in the 1930s. But his first namesake cars didn't debut until 1946. Since then, Porsche has built its reputation on its road cars. First the 356, then the 911, among others, as well as its race cars. Many times the winner of endurance races at Le Mans and Daytona. While the company's flagship has been the 911 Turbo, a brand new Porsche supercar has joined the ranks, the Carrera GT. The Carrera GT represents the epitome of the company's illustrious track record for technical innovation. Like the 911 Turbo, the Carrera GT could compete on a racetrack with few modifications. Its suspension is tight, its center of gravity low, its carbon fiber body very lightweight, and its aerodynamics maximized. The rear spoiler is signature Porsche. It can be electronically raised for maximum downforce at high speeds. Combined with its integrated front spoiler, which keeps the front end from lifting at top speeds, the Carrera GT makes the most of its 5.5 liter, 560 horsepower V10 engine. Top speed, a breathtaking 205 miles per hour. To slow down, Porsche has given the car its ceramic composite brakes. The ceramic brake disc is a specially treated carbon fiber material, cross-drilled and internally vented. The brake pad is a composite material. Together, they greatly reduce heat generated from hard braking and have optimum resistance to brake fade. Of course, all this technology, as well as its pedigree, has just as impressive a price tag, $440,000. In its first year, Porsche plans to build only 1,500 Carrera GTs. Champion driver Steve Saline whose Irvine, California company has built its reputation racing and customizing Mustangs and competition cars, is now building his own version of the car of the future. The $360,000 Celine S7 is a direct translation of racing technology adapted to street use. A lot of sports cars or supercars have really been developed out of racing. Our motorsports background has really enabled us to take almost 99% uh, of what we've learned on the racetrack and put it into our street cars. Every S7 is custom built by hand. Its 560 horsepower all aluminum V8 can hit top speeds in excess of 200 miles an hour. Its dynamic styling is made possible by knowledge gained in the aerospace industry. Aerospace is using a lot of exotic materials. Those materials are making their way now into passenger and production cars. The S7's body, for example, is 100% carbon fiber. Carbon fiber is as strong as aluminum and ultralight weight, and it can be formed in ways metal can't. This advantage is more than cosmetic. It's all about keeping the car glued to the road at high speeds. Its 64 air vents enhance the S7's aerodynamics. The vents funnel the oncoming air around and through the car, reducing drag and improving downforce. We have achieved a very elaborate system of vents and ducts that allow a continuous airstream throughout the whole car. That starts at the front through what you see here with the vents and the ducting into an airfoil literally on the side of the car which then in turn channels it into the engine compartment and then back through the back of the car giving us the best aerodynamics of any production car on the road today. With a price tag of around $400,000,
the power of the S7 will remain in the hands of a few. But Steve believes you're getting a glimpse of the future of everyday automobiles when you feast your eyes on his supercar. What we're really watching, and I think you'll see, is that the use of this materials and the layout and the way it gets adapted from the racing will eventually make its way into everyday passenger cars. And it just is a matter of time and a matter of cost before it becomes more and more prevalent. In 1911, Ray Haroon won the Indianapolis 500 without the use of a riding mechanic. He utilized a new feature that allowed him to see what was happening behind him. Soon after, rear view mirrors became a standard item on passenger vehicles. Modern Marvel's Car Tech of the Future will return on the History Channel. The type of engines that will power cars in the future is a subject of much debate. Predictions are as varied as there are models of cars today. But one thing is for sure. We are on the verge of a new era every bit as revolutionary as the one that began the age of the automobile. Is it still going to be piston engine cars that are run on gasoline? Maybe we are going to end up going back to electrics. There's this new propulsion system called fuel cells. Maybe we're going to start turning to that now. So it's very much up in the air, just like it was back then. At the beginning of the 20th century, the technical future of the horseless carriage was undecided. There was no dominant technology. Early cars were powered in a variety of ways. Steam powered railroad cars. It powered boats. Why couldn't it power cars? The steam cars during their day were among the fastest cars. A steam car, you had maximum torque at zero RPM, so acceleration was lightning quick for 1900, 1905. The name synonymous with steam cars is the Stanley Steamer, created by Francis and Freeland Stanley in 1897. A boiler provided enough pressure to drive a two-cylinder engine located under the floor. The motor had only 16 moving parts and no spark plugs, transmission, clutch, or gear shift. The downside? It took at least half an hour to get up ahead of steam. In 1906, the Stanley brothers built a streamlined speed car powered by a 184 cubic inch twin piston steam engine. This compares to a 735 cubic inch V8 internal combustion engine. Driver Fred Marriott set a world land speed record of 127 miles an hour on Daytona Beach, which remained unbroken for another four years. The steam car lost out to gasoline engines, only after Cadillac's self-starter made starting those cars easier. Besides steam, electricity powered many automobiles. An electric car was quiet, clean running, and easy to handle. They became popular primarily with ladies of the day because you didn't have to get out and crank it to start it or worry about lighting a steam boiler. You just got in, flicked a switch, pushed a lever, and you just were off uh, silently, effortlessly. And of course, there was the gasoline-powered internal combustion engine. Pound for pound, gasoline had more energy in it than just about any other fuel. It was easy to refuel a car with gasoline. It was fairly quick. Gasoline was very efficient. The gasoline-powered automobile seemed to better reflect the new social realities the horseless carriage was ushering in. The gas car had greater range and speed that could provide more mobility and freedom. The decision to make gasoline the fuel of choice was also aided by a major discovery and an industry's willingness to exploit it. When vast oil reserves were discovered in Texas during the, uh, about the turn of the 20th century, gasoline was it after that. There was no question about it. But now, dwindling oil reserves, a shrinking ozone layer, and other environmental pressures have driven automakers to improve the gasoline engine of today's cars. There's been a lot of environmental pressure to try and make cars meet what they call a zero emissions tailpipe standards. What it's done is it's forced the auto manufacturers to build cars that emit with traditional gasoline engines at the same levels as what it would take to charge an electric car. And so those are currently on the road from a number of manufacturers, but at the same time, these cars are more fuel efficient, 
and for their size, more powerful than cars of the past, and they're probably the best cars that have ever been built. But gasoline power alone is not the only option. Recent technology has created a variety of new engines that may do an even better job of propelling the cars of tomorrow. There's a lot of debate today about what powertrains will emerge tomorrow. Internal combustion engines, hybrid electric, diesel, fuel cells, solar, all of these are great new technologies that are emerging that are making internal combustion engines better. The fact is, I believe it's going to be a matrix of these. This matrix of potential alternative power sources will take years to develop. But one version is already on the market, hybrid technology using gasoline. The hybrids as we see them today, that really means two power sources in the car. What we're used to seeing today is what they call the hybrid electric, which is an internal combustion gasoline engine coupled with an electric motor. Toyota is one of several manufacturers that is already committed to this type of hybrid engine, introducing the Prius to the United States in 2000. This vehicle is the second generation of hybrid technology that Toyota has brought to the U.S. market and combines a very efficient 1.5 liter gasoline engine with a very powerful electric drive system, power electronics and electric motor, and a battery system in the rear. It also has a very sophisticated computer system that monitors the driver requirement for speed and acceleration and then chooses whether to use the gasoline engine in its most efficient range or the electric motor in its most efficient range or the combination of the two to provide the best fuel efficiency for the vehicle. The overall combination gets approximately 55 miles to the gallon in combined city and highway driving. Gasoline engines do a really good job of running high speed, constant speed out on a freeway kind of driving. They're very inefficient in stop and start city driving. Whereas electric motors are very efficient in stop and start city driving and not efficient at high speed freeway driving. The Prius utilizes technology which is a breakthrough because it actually, in a synergistic way, combines the best of an internal combustion engine and an electric drive system. The internal combustion engine allows you to use the infrastructure that exists today the gas stations that are there, current gasoline, emission control rules that exist right now. The electrical components that go with that extend beyond what the IC engine can do and gives us a whole new world. The gas motor is recharging the batteries to run the electric motor the next time you need it. And even when you use the brake to stop, the energy of the brakes is fed back through a generator and recharges the batteries so you don't lose any of that energy. It's a wonderful system. It's the future. Where they really make sense is hybrid technology on larger vehicles, SUVs and trucks, where the disadvantage of a hybrid is you have now two power plants. You have a motor, an engine, and a battery pack as well as the, the normal fuel tank. On a larger vehicle, it makes sense that you have some place to put all those things. Chrysler is already working on such a vehicle for both military and heavy duty use. The Dodge Ram truck combines a 500 horsepower diesel engine with an electric motor that also generates AC power. They call it the contractor special. That is the target market for us and uh, that's where we think the, uh, who would appreciate the value that this vehicle provides. We think that the, the sum total of those efforts on our part is going to give us a, a, up to 10-11% fuel economy improvement in this vehicle. Ford's Model U is an experimental hybrid. It combines an electric motor with an internal combustion engine that uses hydrogen instead of gasoline. The Model U is an interesting vehicle because it was really a serious look on the part of design and our advanced research department as to what would the next generation Model T possibly look like. This is our hydrogen-fueled internal combustion engine plus a hybrid electric vehicle transmission. Many believe hydrogen may one day completely replace gasoline as an automotive fuel. Engineers see this kind of hybrid as a bridge or stepping stone to understanding hydrogen power. We began with the same engine that's in production in our Ford Ranger pickup trucks to the day. Instead of burning gasoline in the engine, we burn hydrogen in the engine to give the engine its, its power. We're also seeing the hybrid electric vehicle transmission system where we've added an electric motor to a standard automatic transmission system. Like the other hybrids, this is a parallel system. Either motor or both can operate as needed for maximum efficiency. Fuel economy is boosted by about 30%. We've actually done some studies and found that a hydrogen fuel car 
is on a par with a gasoline fuel car on safety. There's pluses and minuses for both, and as a whole, it comes out about equal. And people are certainly comfortable with the risk of driving around in their gasoline fuel cars today. They do it every day. So once we can get past the perception of a safety hazard with hydrogen, people should be just as comfortable driving those cars. And the hybrid concept could be pushed way beyond only two power plants. You could have perhaps a half a dozen in the same vehicle. You could have fuel cells, solar power, gasoline, uh, and let's talk about human power. You might even have human power on board your vehicle. You might have a set of pedals under the dashboard so that if we're creeping through traffic, you don't use any external power, you simply pedal it. The history of the electric vehicle precedes the internal combustion engine. In 1835, a small model car powered by batteries was demonstrated by Professor Stratting in the Netherlands. Modern Marvel's car tech of the future will return on the History Channel. What we're looking at is probably the car you'll be driving in the future. Now, while this car looks like an ordinary Ford Focus on the outside, what makes it so special is it has the most advanced powertrain in the world. It's called a fuel cell. It's an electric car that runs on hydrogen. This is the kind of engine that may be under your hood in 20 years. A fuel cell car is really an electric car. That's what runs the wheels is electric motors. And instead of just a battery that you plug into the wall, it has a fuel cell that converts hydrogen and oxygen into electricity to keep the batteries charged. In the most common fuel cell type called a PEM fuel cell, short for proton exchange membrane, hydrogen atoms are stripped of their electrons or ionized. The positively charged protons pass through the exchange membrane, while the electrons pass through a circuit to provide electric power. On the other side, the ions and protons rejoin with oxygen from the air to make H2O, or water. The water vapor is the only tailpipe emission, and the performance is very respectable. In Ford's car, the fuel cell delivers 85 kilowatts of power. That's equal to 117 horsepower. Fuel cells have been around for a long time. What's new is our ability to put it in an automobile and drive down the road. History credits English lawyer turned scientist Sir William Robert Grove as developing what would become known as the fuel cell in 1838. Grove knew that electricity could be used to split a water molecule into its two elements, hydrogen and oxygen, a process known as electrolysis. He figured that the opposite could also be true. His gas battery worked and was later renamed the fuel cell. For more than a century, many others worked on the concept, but it wasn't until the 1960s that fuel cell technology literally took off. NASA needed a compact way to generate electricity for space missions. Nuclear power was too dangerous, batteries were too heavy, and solar was too cumbersome. The fuel cell was the choice. Besides, its waste product could be drinking water for the astronauts. Now just about every major car manufacturer has some sort of working fuel cell prototype. In 2002, the city of Los Angeles became the first U.S. customer to lease a fuel cell car. This made the Honda FCX the first fuel cell vehicle certified by the California Air Resources Board and United States EPA for everyday commercial use. How does it feel, Mayor? It's a great car. Great car. Very smooth acceleration and uh, you don't know what's on though, it's so quiet. The Honda FCX has 80 horsepower with a maximum speed of 93 miles per hour, giving it performance similar to a 2002 Honda Civic but with zero emissions. BMW is testing a full-size 7 Series luxury model. The car has a conventionally designed internal combustion engine running on hydrogen, but it gets that hydrogen from a different kind of fuel cell. It's called an SOFC, or Solid Oxide Fuel Cell. This auxiliary power unit, or APU, can create hydrogen from a variety of fuels, including gasoline and natural gas, Fuel passes through a reformer, which pre-processes it before its conversion to hydrogen through its fuel cells stacked in the trunk.
This APU will also be operating at 42 volts instead of 12, which will become the standard in the next five years. Conventional systems will need bigger engines with larger alternators and emission systems to do the same. With the advent of 42 volt systems, uh, several manufacturers are building cars where it's a much larger motor generator. So it's the starter motor, when you want to first start the car, once the car is running, it serves as a generator to take the place of the alternator. And it's big enough and powerful enough and durable enough that when you come to a stop, it actually allows the car to be shut off and then start it back up again as soon as you put your foot on the accelerator to drive through an intersection or behind something that's made you stop in the idea of saving fuel. Toyota's experimental fuel cell is the FCHV, based on their Highlander SUV. It's capable of speeds of up to 95 miles per hour and has a range of 150 miles. The hydrogen cars of tomorrow are not that far away. Uh, we've already sold two in the state of California, and they're running. They're full SUVs. have had great experience from them. We're developing the technology to identify what we can do to commercialize it. Commercialization will eventually bring down the high costs of manufacturing hydrogen vehicles, but automakers want to make sure these cars of the future are as practical as cars of the present. We have to make the technology reliable. If your car crashed as much as your computer system crashed, you wouldn't want anything to do with it. What makes running an automobile with a fuel cell complicated is not the fuel cell, but the fuel. Although it's the most abundant element in the universe, hydrogen is expensive and difficult to isolate, and it's highly flammable. So why use it? Hydrogen is very potent, with about three times as much energy by weight as gasoline but with no toxic emissions. Let me show you what's in the trunk. This is a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle, and this is where we store that hydrogen, in this tank. Hydrogen is like a fuel, just like gasoline. You have to treat it with respect, and you have to treat it in a certain manner. It's not the Hindenburg, it's not gonna explode, it's not a hydrogen bomb, it's very safe. These cars go through very, very rigorous testing, including crash testing. There is another obstacle, finding a hydrogen gas station. A few experimental fueling stations have been set up in California to support the handful of hydrogen fuel cell cars on the road. But it's a far cry from the type of infrastructure needed to support the massive use of this new technology. But proponents of hydrogen believe the obstacles aren't as great as the benefits. It's very easy to fuel a hydrogen vehicle. Hydrogen is not messy, it's non-toxic, it doesn't spill, it doesn't smell. You hook the receptacle up, the vehicle talks to the station, about 30 seconds, you can drive away. The fact is, our current hydrogen fueling station uses tap water. We use electricity through the water to crack the hydrogen out. The hydrogen is compressed, put into the tank of the car, and the car drives. Absolutely no pollution. And the electricity that we use here is all renewable from either solar power, or hydro, or wind. The only emission from the car is a little bit of water vapor. If you're really thirsty, you could drink what comes out of the tailpipe. Hydrogen is clean, it's inexhaustible, it's just everywhere. And uh, that's the power I think that we need to utilize to fuel our economy. Cost has to come down and we need to create a hydrogen infrastructure so people can refuel their hydrogen-powered cars. Those are the two obstacles that are gonna take another 15 or 20 years to fully perfect before they're on the road in common. 10 years from now, you'll begin to see hydrogen-powered cars here or there, but 15 to 20 years from now, they'll be the norm. Fuel cell technology will also change the way an automobile is designed. With hydrogen, it's likely that the components that make up the complete hydrogen storage and propulsion system will be much more flexible in arranging them around the vehicle in a different way. So we then begin to see the car or any road vehicle take on much more interesting and different forms. The internal combustion engine is no longer going to dominate. This unconventional approach to design is evident in GM's high-wire concept car. Free of a bulky internal combustion engine, it creates a very low-profile passenger cabin with a lot of room. Its hydrogen fuel cell and every other operational system 
are mounted within an 11-inch platform underneath. This platform or skateboard idea could usher in a system of interchangeable modules that a customer could buy and place on top of the skateboard. What this means with that, with that skateboard or platform concept is they can go into a dealership showroom and they can order up an SUV and they can even be for a couple of years. Well, maybe they want it to be a sports car when the kids are out to school. They can come back to the dealership, they can take off those pieces that they'd ordered previously, and they can put on the sports car package for the, the midlife crisis, if you will. The possibilities are just phenomenal. Internal combustion engines convert less than 30% of the energy of gasoline into power. Electric motors powered by hydrogen utilize 40 to 60% of the fuel's energy. Modern Marvel's car tech of the future will return on the History Channel. When it comes to the automobile, Americans love to take a good idea and make it their own. For some, it's about style. For others, it's about something deeper. We all want to say something. We want to make a statement. And some of us want to make a statement with our cars. And that statement can be anything from, I'm a real cool, sporty, high-performance kind of guy, to, I'm working to save our planet. A growing number of people are making just that statement with their cars. They're customizing, modifying, and changing their vehicles into clean, green street machines. It's perfectly legitimate to try modifying your car to run on an unconventional fuel or get astounding fuel economy or not pollute as much. That's a, a brand of personalization that a lot of us could applaud, actually. Attracting attention to this philosophy, driving outside the box, was the goal on April 30th, 2003, at the Santa Monica Pier in Southern California. That's when media, friends, family, and celebrities kicked off Dennis Weaver's Drive to Survive, the first American cross-continent convoy of advanced and alternative-fueled vehicles. Yeah, my husband says, what are you doing here? I said, well, what we're doing here is we're going to change the world. <laughs> At least we're going to change the energy that propels the world. The idea was to show people a variety of ways cars could operate without using a typical gasoline engine. Rolling out on hydrogen. Hydrogen. <laughs> Two hot blondes in the red hot hybrid. Well, we got to do it. We're going to run out of oil, folks. Yeah, you can't grow it, can't manufacture it. No. Yeah. So, you know, scientists are telling us it's going to be gone in 30, 40 years, probably earlier. Okay, you're here. Ready? One, two. Actor Larry Hagman, who played a rich Texas oil man in the TV show Dallas, and fellow co star Linda Gray got their first look at a hydrogen powered fuel cell. I can't wait. This is great. They also got a peek at a hydrogen hot rod. What you're looking at is a 64 Cobra body donated by Carol Shelby, and the engine was put together to run on pure hydrogen. And this, what we're trying to do is use a clean fuel, and yet we still get the performance out of it. What more can you ask for? Every hot rod will kill for this car. Russell Gerke will be making the drive in his 2003 Dodge Cumming 3500 series pickup truck. I started out in Missouri, and i got to end up back in Missouri. I'm going to be packing on close to 6,000 miles. Russell's 305-horsepower diesel engine will be running the whole way on a biofuel made from soybeans. Cross the country twice, what I got in the back of the truck here. Soybeans can pack a punch. In 2002, Russell fueled and engineered Mark Smith's jet car, Wild Fang, hey, into the record books. We ran 211 miles an hour on biodiesel in the eighth mile and uh, set a world record for renewable fuel speed. And this was done in a turbine. It makes a great jet fuel also. It makes a jet run great. Powering an engine on biofuel is not a new idea. Rudolf Diesel successfully developed the basic technology in the late 1800s. He produced the diesel to run on a variety of fuels, and one of those fuels being vegetable oil. When he, he debuted the motor at one conference, he was running it on peanut oil. And uh, we call these fuels fatty acid esters. So what's going on now? 100 years have passed. 
<laughs> we're going back to what he'd originally designed the motor to run on in the first place, methyl esters. Biofuels burn 90% cleaner than regular diesel and give Russell as much as 40 miles per gallon, almost doubling the truck's mileage, but with no loss of horsepower. It's not months, it's not weeks. We can make biodiesel now. The capacity's there. It's quick to make, it's easy to make. The byproducts are food, soap, and fuel. End of story. The planned route of the caravan of cars is up the California coast and then across the country, stopping in 20 different cities before ending at the capital in Washington, D.C. On the long road, the drive to survive cars got to test their technologies, efficiency, performance, and durability. The caravan met with enthusiasm everywhere they went. And finally, after 15 days, the cars rolled on to Capitol Hill. It's great to see you. How was the drive? Terrific. That's just great. We're always trying things. You know, that's the nature of human beings. We're a species that creates. And this reminds me somewhat of the horse and buggy days when they started making the automobile. People were saying, well, what's it going to do with all the, the jobs related to horses? And what we did is we lost some of those jobs, but we more than compensated for those losses by creating new jobs. And that's exactly what's going to happen when we move to a hydrogen economy. For less than $5,000 and only a few days of tinkering, Utah's freestyle skier, Ty Robinson, modified his 1999 Toyota Tacoma 4x4 into the intergalactic hydrogen car, or what he calls the poor man's fuel cell. The only two parts I've had to put underneath the hood is one dry gas carburetor and one all-in-wonder pressure regulator, zero pressure diaphragm. The current vehicles that we have, the internal combustion engine, we have all the parts available that are right off the shelf. You can put on that engine and make it multi-fuel capable. Ty's truck can run on pure hydrogen, but he wanted to cross the country without having to refill his limited supply contained in these pressurized tanks. A kilogram of hydrogen is around the BTU equivalent to a gallon of gasoline. And since I'm achieving 22 miles per kilo on hydrogen, I have a range of 110 miles on straight hydrogen here. But the, the benefit to get all the way across country, I had to extend that range. So that's where I went to high boosting, just putting a small amount of hydrogen in with the gasoline and air mixture. Then the range is dramatically increased. From Capitol Hill to the snow-covered mountains of Telluride, Colorado, meet Cheris Ford. He's busy modifying his 1980 International Scout truck's fuel system for the winter. So what I'm doing here with this gas tank, or grease tank as the case may be, is I'm insulating it because it's so far from the engine cavity where things are typically warm that I want to kind of do everything I can to keep it nice and warm in, in, the, in the tank, make sure our fuel doesn't gel. It's because his alternative fuel vehicle runs not on diesel, electricity, or even the sun. It's powered by recycled kitchen grease. Cheris calls his biodiesel fuel greaseline. In colder temperatures, it will turn solid just like cooking grease does in the refrigerator. His insulated fuel tank and lines keep his fast food fuel flowing. And when it does, you'll know it. Oh my God, it does. It smells like french fries. <laughs> hey, Lucas, what's going on? Cheris makes periodic visits to local restaurants to collect the grease. He drains it right out of the deep fryers and into containers. Later, the grease is strained to get out the chunks. Yes, come back next week. I'll probably have like four more for you. Okay, great. It's just simply eliminating waste. And we've got to eliminate waste. For example, this fry and drive idea has made Cheris famous around town. Good evening and welcome to Doc Talk. My guest tonight, Cheris Ford. Cheris, let's go ahead and take this call. Hey, John, what's going on? prompting periodic interviews at the radio station. It speaks to bio-friendly fuel, and uh, I do, I have this dream that one day I might have a hand in creating one of the nation's first alternative energy stations, you know, like Hippie Smoothie Bar with a variety of biofuels that you could get, whether they be hydrogen for your fuel cell vehicle or ethanol or, or uh, biodiesel for your big truck. Doris is one of those guys that doesn't follow in the footsteps of other people. He's making his own footsteps, and I love that.
1912, Rudolf Diesel said, the use of vegetable oils for engine fuels may seem insignificant today, but such oils may become, in the course of time, as important as petroleum and the coal tar products of the present time. Modern Marvel's Car Tech of the Future will return on the History Channel. Car technology has made almost any car imaginable possible. But the success or failure of a production car is a high-stakes game. Of the GT40. When we plan a car today, we plan it. Used to be five years in advance. Now through technology, we can do them in three years. But you got to bet the farm, like on a model, a billion dollars at one time, that three years from now, whatever car or truck you built, you'll be able to get your investment back. So it's a crapshoot. That's why, it's, to me, it's a fascinating business. It's a, not for everybody, not for the timid, believe me. For that very reason, automakers rely on a very special kind of car. One that helps both them and the public to decide whether it's worth bringing a car like it to the market. They're called concept cars. Automobile companies unveil their latest concept car creations with great fanfare and showmanship. The Volkswagen Magellan. These one-of-a-kind experimental vehicles are what every manufacturer uses to explore the future. When we look at concept cars, in each one of them we see a fragment of the future, and some more than others because of, of the nature of the design. It's the role of the concept car to help guide scientists and engineers and designers as they bring all these elements together to build the future world we're going to enjoy. The concept car is a necessary component in development of new technology. And so when we test the concepts, we're testing not only the reaction, but how they perform in the real world. We can improve on that and make cars of the future even better. The first stage of the process is a sketch on paper. Any design starts off as an idea in a designer's mind. So the first stage is to transfer it from the mind onto a medium which other people can share with them. Next, the designers sculpt their concept in clay. It's fine to be able to think in two dimensions, but you have also to be able to think in three dimensions. So the next phase, fundamentally, is to convert those sketches into a three-dimensional representation. This traditional process can also now be done with computers. With the computers and stuff, you can really expand your whole vocabulary of design. You can really explore new fundamental concepts that will really change the way we move around. A car designer of the future is really going to be a concept engineer. He's really going to have to be conscious of the package, conscious of how people sit in vehicles, how they interact with the vehicles. With computer technology, that, that process opens up a whole new world to us. To move from a sketch on a piece of paper to a hard model design to production in 12 to 18 months, it's a radical thing. A concept can be a technological study. A concept can be a pre-production vehicle that is only calling attention to a vehicle that we will eventually put into production. Or a concept can be a dream. And we, we called those years ago dream cars, and that's exactly what they are. And those are probably the purest form of sheer fantasy that an auto designer can come up with. General Motors was the first company that really devoted an, a department to styling vehicles. And it was really Alfred Sloan, who was the president of General Motors back in 1926-1927. Alfred Sloan believed in the future that design would play a major role in influencing people to buy vehicles. Sloan began the art and color section of GM and hired a young Californian named Harley Earl to run it. Earl had earned a reputation for building custom cars for Hollywood movie stars. His first car for GM was the 1927 LaSalle, a fast, sharp-looking two-seater. With its flowing lines and low profile, the new car created a sensation. In 1938, Earl created what would come to be considered the first corporate car built solely as an experiment in style and function, the Buick Y-Job. The Y-Job featured retractable soft top roof, power windows, and concealed headlights. In 1950, Earl's team unveiled what is widely considered to be one of the most outstanding concept cars ever built, the jet fighter-inspired LeSabre. I think you can see how this car has been influenced, you know, by the by the jet age, the emerging jet age. You know, there's a 
air intake and in a front like a jet air intake. And what's really cool about that is the headlights swivel around. So they're hidden and they swivel around in, in the front air intake. The LeSabre had heated seats and a rain detector to automatically put up the convertible top. The interior continued the fighter jet motif and the LeSabre was the first car to have a wraparound windshield, which all cars now have. It was just a lot of technology in this vehicle for the early 50s, so it wasn't just a great looker. I mean, this, this car was all about the future. Taking the concept car to the outer limits in 1954, Earl introduced the first of his Firebird cars. And this was a car that was turbine powered. It sat one person. It looked like a fuselage with wings. followed the Firebird 1 with the even wilder Firebirds 2 and 3. Like many concept cars, the Firebirds were built to give their parent company bragging rights. Harley Earl didn't have that car built to test public reaction to the idea of it going into production. He had it built to tease the public, to say, look at General Motors, look what we're doing. We are thinking so far ahead of everybody else, just think of what kind of technology is embodied in your production car if we're thinking this far ahead already. The optimism of the 50s, uh, to use one example, is what actually created those fabulous cars with tail fins and afterburner tail lamps and gobs of chrome all over them because we really thought that that's what the future would look like. Though none of these fantastic concept cars ever saw the assembly line, they helped automakers and the public to find the direction of car design for the fast approaching future. The result? A whole new generation of concept cars. Today's concept cars are no less enthralling, offering new dreams for a new age. At least so far in this century, it's all about choice. And people want adventure, they want status, they want retrospective design, they want optimism, they want rebellion. Your future is your choice, and we're going to deliver that on a plate that allows you to pick from a spectrum of possibilities, because the whole point of design is for us to try to make your life better. The role of science fiction will also have a strong influence in predicting what cars will look like in the future. If you want something with an impact that makes people think, wow, that is really different, then you really have to radically change the proportions. Designer Harold Belker did just that when he conceived of a sports car for Steven Spielberg's futuristic film, Minority Report. Belker believes this is what a Lexus may look like in the year 2054. You ask yourself, what would it take to really push it over the top? So the answer was that I shifted the whole proportion so far forward that a lot of people, when they saw the car, thought it was actually going the other way, which is, in a way, a great success because you really have to introduce a new shape that people are not comfortable with. With that shape, we're going to see probably a lot more designs in that direction and then at some point there are going to be people who introduce completely different shapes. Science fiction has pretty steadily predicted actual technological progress. Sid Mead is a former car designer who has visualized the far distant future in films such as Tron, 2010, Alien and Blade Runner. Consider this view of car technology of the future in Mead's illustration known as the Silver Coach. So you arrive in this vehicle. Now you've got high technology because there's one wheel in the front and that big black sphere in back is the traction, the motive power, the steering and suspension, everything. And it literally is floating in this loop that it's trapped in by electromagnetic attraction. Because it's a sphere, you can roll the thing down around in a circle and park it. You can go forward, back, stop, start. So it's an idea for a very elaborate kind of vehicle. And you can just see the two people in back getting out. They're, they've just arrived. And you can make anything of it that you like. The 1956 Firebird II concept car was part of a plan for a controlled access electronic highway system. The roadway would have embedded wires for cars to pick up the signal and steer the vehicle automatically. Modern Marvel's Car Tech of the Future will return on the History Channel. 
The ultimate car technology of the future has to be a vehicle with all the comforts of a car without the constraints of the ground. The so-called flying car. Flying cars already exist. Flying cars were developed in the 1960s. The first flying car to be certified by the Civil Aeronautics Administration, the predecessor of the FAA, was the Airphibian, a plane adapted for the road. Its six-cylinder engine could fly at 120 miles per hour and drive at 50 miles per hour. In the 1960s, the aero car gained notoriety flying on TV shows. The cockpit was a fiberglass shell based on a Geo Metro car. A 10-foot long drive shaft connected the engine to a pusher propeller. Even though this was the most successful flying car ever built, lack of venture capital kept mass production on the ground. The aero car was the last rotable aircraft to receive FAA approval. Since the 1980s, Carl Moeller and his company, Moeller International, has been working on hovercraft technology. This early model uses eight rotary engines generating 400 horsepower. Rotary engines are giant fans pushing air downward to create lift. Moeller's new experimental M400 Skycar uses four rotary engines generating 720 horsepower. The engines can rotate after liftoff to create forward thrust. Top speed is projected to be 380 miles an hour. This computer-generated hovercraft from Macro Industries shows what a personal hovercraft of the future might look like. Its flight characteristics are very similar to a helicopter. But while cross-country commuting might be practical, grocery shopping might be a lot more complicated. We have problems with drivers who can't look right and left. Think about if they have to be in the air and look right, left, and now up and down. I think eventually the day will come where technology will catch up and we will have a flying car that popular science and all those people in the 50s really wanted to see. Every year, more and more serious scientists assume that we will figure out why gravity works, we really don't know still, and how to control it. So you've got to have a capacitor, like a gravity capacitor of some kind, and then carefully control the energy going into the capacitor and coming back out, like you do in any version of electronics in order to control gravity, and I think we'll, we'll do it. Today, the future of car technology is taking shape at schools, such as the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, California. For 70 years, this campus has educated more named car designers than any other place in the world. Here, the students must master the various skills they'll need to design the cars of tomorrow, a role that will grow in importance in the years ahead. There's some huge opportunities for the car industry in future to think more about uh, a much greater array of vehicles that any particular customer might choose to use according to what their journey is going to be. And we're encouraging our students to start thinking a lot more about what kinds of vehicles should we be designing which will enable people still to have the freedom of use of the automobile without some of the drawbacks. Michael Rinaldi's project is to create a car that could help alleviate traffic congestion problems in major cities. Futuristic thing about my vehicle is that it's self-driving. It's satellite GPS controlled. Um, we're about two to three years away from having a vehicle that can legitimately run around in, in an environment by itself being controlled by GPS satellites. Being that it's self-guided, the vehicle can literally drop you off at a terminal in front of the building, in front of a school, such as like a theme park ride, and they can they can run off by themselves and go park themselves. You never have to go find your car again if you don't have to. If there's any trend in the history of car technology, it's that we'll keep one eye on the past while looking towards the future. I think the important thing about technology is it changes because lifestyles change. And if you don't keep up with it, you lose sort of a important segments of the market. There have been huge strides in efficiency in terms of emissions and fuel economy in the cars that we drive today compared to those of, of even 10 years ago, never mind 30 or 40. So efficiency, emissions control, those are clearly trends that are going to continue. What we're trying to do is to build vehicles that absolutely have no trade-offs, where you have safety, environmental responsibility, emotion, fun to drive, easy, convenient, luxurious. Customers of today no longer want just one of those, they want all of them. You can't always get all, all those things out of the same package at the same time, but you can have a selection, just a keyboard on the dashboard, to decide how you want your car to be at any given instant, whether you want it to have high performance or high economy. It's extremely difficult to say what 
kinds of cars we're going to be driving in the future. But whatever they are, you know they're going to be very aerodynamic, you know that they're going to be very clean, they're going to use materials that can be recycled, and they're going to look really, really cool. The automobile's rich history has proven time and time again that the only limit on its future is man's ability to dream.